Hello, this is Professor Kitch. Um, this short webcast is to show you how to reduce the data from your geotech consolidation test and turn the data you get from the software into the engineering data that you need for your lab. I'm going to cover four different topics in this presentation. The first is I'll show you how to import the geotech data file into Excel, which is where we'll do the conversions. Then I'll show you how to convert the sensor voltage from the program into the engineering units we need to do the analysis. And then finally, I'll show you how to generate both the strain versus log time plots and finally your strain versus log stress plot. The first step is to import the geotech data file into Excel. Before you do that, you must have saved your data file someplace on your computer where you can find it. Once you've done that, open up Excel and then go to the File menu to import the file. Click on File and navigate to the location where you've stored the file. When you get to that directory, you might initially not see any files in there because this file name doesn't have an Excel extension. So the first thing you need to go is to come down to this extension tab and look for all files. When you do that, you will see the CTF file that you've stored there. Open up that file. When you open the file, you'll get this screen which is asking you to import it in a certain format. We're going to use the delimited for format to do that. So make sure delimited is checked. Then go to next and make sure that you picked tab as the delimiter. And you can go to next and then just finish. This will import the entire data file. You'll have to expand the columns. And I find that setting a column width of about 15 is good for what we need to do. Once you've done that, you'll find that the data file is divided into three sections. The header section at the top has just the list of the basic information for your file, where it was stored, the project number, the sample descriptions, and that information. The second section down here has all the data for the sensors. I'll highlight that in a yellow color. This is has the data for each sensor that's connected. It has the calibration factors and the excitation voltage and the other information we'll need. Below that, you'll see a section for each load step that you performed. So the first one here, which I'll highlight in green, is for step number one. And it has a reading of the time that each reading was taken, the data from the external load cell, the data from the displacement device, and it also has a column labeled platen position, which tells us something about how the motor's working. We're going to ignore that one. If you scroll down lower, you'll see that there's another section, section for the time step two and another section for time step three. So each one of these, we're going to have to take the raw data and turn it into the information that we want. Before you go any further, it's a good time to save this file. So be sure to come to File and do a save as because you imported this as a certain type of file and you want to save it as an XLS file. So go to the location you want to save it. Be sure to click and save it as an Excel workbook. Otherwise, you're going to lose all the data. Click on that and type in the table you want it to be. I console data and save your file. And don't forget to save it early and often. This takes us to step two, which is to convert the sensor voltages into engineering units. The sensors we use in this test don't actually return the engineering units that we want to measure, but they actually just return voltages. For example, the load cell returns a voltage which is proportional to the load on the cell, but it's not in pounds or newtons or anything like that. And the displacement center returns a voltage which is proportional to the displacement, but it's not the actual displacement. So in order to get from these output voltages to the actual engineering units we want, we need to use this formula, where RE is the actual engineering units we want. So this is either pounds for the load cell, or inches or millimeters for the displacement sensor. So to do that conversion, we take V sub S, which is the actual signal voltage put out by the sensor, subtract from that V0, which is the signal voltage at zero engineering units, so the signal voltage at zero pounds force or the signal voltage at zero displacement. We divide those by the excitation voltage. That's the voltage we actually put into the, to the sensor. So the 
the amount of voltage out is going to be proportional to the excitation voltage. And then we multiply that by C sub F, which is a calibration factor. That's the actual factor that converts the voltage to engineering units. So we'll, we'll be using this equation, R sub E equals C sub F times the quantity V sub S minus V sub zero divided by V sub E. That's the basic formula we'll be using to convert. So now we're ready to start our conversion. We're going to insert our engineering converted values out here in this section. So I'm going to highlight with that with a slightly darker green so we know where we're going. The very first thing that we're going to want to do is determine the elapsed time for each of the readings. So this column will be the elapsed time column. And I'm going to do this in minutes. To get the elapsed time column, we're going to have to subtract the starting time, which is over here in block A24, from any of the other times. So I'm going to enter a, a formula right here. I'm just typing in equals, and it's going to be A24, and I'm going to subtract A24 from the same cell, and that's going to give me the elapsed time for the first one, uh, reading, which is going to be zero. Now I want to lock in this cell right here, A24, so that when I copy that to the rest of the cells down here, the elapsed time um, always goes back to the zero time. So in other words, this cell right here is going to be subtracting A24 from A27. That's what the dollar sign does. It locks in that original cell up there. Now it should be obvious that the numbers in this column right here are not in minutes. To get these to minutes, you need to understand how Excel stores times and the way Excel stores a time is as a number that's equal to the number of days of the time since the start date of 1900. So these are actually in days right now. So in order to convert these from days to minutes I'm going to take this equation in this cell and I'm going to multiply the value times 1440 which is the number of minutes in a day and then I'm going to copy that cell again down. And now I have the readings in terms of minutes. And I don't like this format, so I'm going to shrink these down a little bit. And let's say I get to minutes and hundreds. That's fine. So now I have the reading here in minutes. So the first reading is 0. The second was taken at 0.5 minutes, 0.12 minutes, 0.18 minutes, etc. And our last reading here was taken just a little over 30 minutes in this cycle. So our next step is to actually compute the applied stress. And I want to do this in pounds per square foot. And to do that, we're going to have to remember our conversion formula between voltage and engineering units. Remember that's V sub S minus V0 over VE, all times C sub F is going to give us the reading and engineering units. So I have to put that formula in right here. I'm going to scroll up a little bit so I can get to my calibration data from the sensors. And so let's just type that formula right in here. So the first thing this is going to be, we're going to take C sub F, which is the calibration factor. Now we're doing the external load cell, so that is going to be this calibration factor right there. That's going to get multiplied by the quantity. V sub S is our reading off of the load cell, so that's right here, minus V sub 0, which is a reading at 0. Well, that number is right up here under the calibration data again, and that quantity is going to be divided by our excitation voltage, V sub E, that's right here, and that now gives us the reading, except this quantity is in pounds, it's not in pounds per square foot because we're reading from the load cell and the load cell just reads in pounds. So to convert this value from pounds to pounds per square foot I'm going to have to divide by the cross-sectional area of the specimen and if we scroll back up here to the data about the specimen we'll see that right here we have the diameter of the specimen. So I'm going to compute out here the area of the specimen in square feet. I'm going to put that in this cell here, F7. So that's going to be equal to the diameter squared times pi 
divided by 4. That'll be the area. So that's the area in square inches there, 4.9 square inches. But I want it in square feet. So I need to divide that by 144, which is how to convert square inches to square feet. And so I have 0 0.034 square feet. So to convert uh, this pounds number I have down in here in cell F24 to pounds per square foot, I simply have to take this value and divide it by the value up here in F7. And now this gives me the stress being applied, uh, which is pounds per square foot. Uh, I'm again going to uh, shrink that down some, so I've got a number that's a little easier to read. So I'll do that to hundreds. And now the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to come into this formula, and I'm going to go in and again and lock in with dollar signs all the cells I don't want to change when I copy it. So that's going to be the cell F7. It's, it's going to be the cell uh, B17 and B18. It's not going to be cell B24 because that's where my sensor data are, but B16 is also going to need to be locked in. So that's going to lock in all those cells. And now when I copy this down for the whole area, you'll see that um, I have all these equations are correct. And you'll notice here that uh, this step was the load was supposed to be 100. PSF, that's what this 100 there means. And you'll notice it took us about oh, four tenths of a minute for the load, uh, load cell to catch up to that, but then it pretty much stayed at 100 plus or minus a little bit for the rest of the duration of this particular step. The final value I need to calculate is the strain, and I'm going to put that here in the G column. So to compute the strain, the first thing I need to compute is the actual relative displacement. So I'm going to need, again, our engineering unit formula here to do that. Um, and looking at that formula, I'm going to have that the engineering units for displacement are going to be the calibration factor for the displacement gauge, which is up here, calibration factor in C16. That's going to be times the quantity. Um, B sub S is going to be my, my displacement uh, sensor reading right here. From that I'm going to subtract the displacement zero reading. Now I'm not going to use the zero reading up here in cell C18 but rather I'm going to use cell C24 as the reading because I want my displacements for this to be relative to the beginning of the test not some arbitrary zero displacement on the gauge. So this is going to be the zero reading I'm going to divide that by the excitation voltage here, which is in C17. Uh, and so that whole quantity should be my um, displacement. Now, um, for the displacement for the first L, uh, reading is going to be zero, because that's how I set my zero reading up. But I do need to come in here and lock in all the cells I don't want to change. So I don't want the um, excitation voltage to change. I don't want my zero reading here to change, so I'm going to change this C24. The next one I'm not going to change because that's my actual uh, um, reading from the sensor. And then finally I do want to change the calibrate, uh, lock in the calibration factor because I don't want it to change. And then when I copy this cell now down to the whole length of this, I'm going to have displacement when each reading was taken. But I don't want the displacement in here, I want the strain. So if you recall that the strain is going to be the displacement divided by the original length, I just need to divide these readings of displacement in here by the original length. But you also recall the, the original length of our specimen, or in this case the thickness of it, was one inch. So in order to get strain, I need to divide all these quantities by one, which isn't going to change them. So I'll just leave them like this, and they are strain. I would, however, like to change these values of strain to percent strain because these numbers are kind of small. So let me change my heading here and put percent in there. And then in order to get these from decimal strain to percent strain, I'm just going to have to multiply each one times 100. So I'll multiply that first formula times 100 and then copy it down through all the cells. And now I have these all in percent strain. And again, I'm going to make those numbers a little smaller going to get down here to just thousands 
and now we'll see that uh, in terms of percent strain I start off at it here at zero and by the end of this test my percent strain is uh, at 0.17 percent so not even two tenths of a percent of strain now I want to also just repeat all these calculations for the next time step so I'm gonna come here and copy the top two sets of rows here the the heading row and then the first set of formulas and I'm come, gonna come down here and copy those to the next time step which is right here and now I have the equations copied down to the next time step but I do need to make some adjustments to these so first of all let's look at the elapsed time here and check the formula out and you notice that for the elapsed time formula it's going back to this first reading in the previous time step for the zero time for the elapsed time but that's not what I want to be zero I want the time increments to reset themselves at the beginning of each time step so I want to change this cell to be right down here and that'll give me a time step um, where the zero reading is actually the first reading in this next um, set of calculations so that's now set up and we're going to check that my stress reading is correct so it's taking the load cell reading from the correct place and I'm gonna scroll up to make sure all the other readings are right and they're all correct because it's taking the calibration factors from the right place so that one's fine and then I'm also finally gonna check the strain one to make sure it's fine now it's taking the strain readings the calibration factors again from the calibration data now it's taking the zero reading from the beginning at time step one but that's where I want it to be I want all of my displacement measurements for all of the different time steps to go back to that moment when the very first reading was taken at the very first load increment so that's actually correct so now I've checked all of these formula and they are correct and so now I can copy these down for the rest of this load step and I'll have the time elapsed time for the, t the time step itself and the stress that's not going to change and the strain for this load step and I could repeat that next thing for the, the next step which is step three and so forth throughout the whole rest of the readings and now I have my time stress and strain for each of the load increments done we're now up to our third step of this process, which is to generate the strain versus log time plots. So let's do that next. I'll start to create the graph by highlighting the strain that we want to plot. And then I'm going to go to the insert menu and pick under charts a scatter plot. It's important that we do a scatter plot. Don't do an XY plot. XY plots are generally uh, not useful for engineering plotting. And I want to do a plot where we put both the lines and the points because I want to be able to see all the data points. So this is the chart we're going to use. I'm going to move that over to the right so we can see a little better. And so now we've got a plot of the strain but the x-axis isn't correct. So I'm going to right click on the graph and go down here to select data. You can also pull this off the top menu but I like to right click. I'm going to edit this data. And The first thing we're going to do is pick the series name so we uh, have a name and I'm going to highlight these two cells uh, A22 and B22 because that's going to automatically pick up that this is step one and that the stress we applied at this step was 100 PSF that way we won't accidentally confuse this with another plot and then I've got to select the X data and I want up this plot as a function of the time so I'm going to select time here and click that again click OK and click OK now I have a plot of the strain versus time but I don't want this to be strain versus time I want it to be strain versus log time so I'm gonna again right click here on the axis and I'm gonna click format axis so I can format the x-axis let me scroll this over so we can see a little better the first thing I'm gonna do is come down here and click uh, the logarithm scales because that's what we want to do now we're gonna get a message that we have zero values in here which you can't plug in a log scale I'm just gonna click OK because it just the system's just gonna ignore that and so now we have it plotted versus a log scale but the scales kinda messed up here and I don't really care about this first data point here that it's at less than a tenth of a minute so I'm gonna put my minimum up here to 0.1 minutes 
And then the other problem I got here is that the y-axis here crosses at 1 uh, by default, and we're not, that's no good. So I'm going to come down here where the vertical axis crosses. I'm going to change that from 1 to 0 0.1 so that it's now crossing at 0 0.1. And now that axis looks pretty good. I do also want to come down here to tick marks and add in the minor ticks and tell it to put those on the inside because it's really important in a semi-log plot that you get these tick marks because otherwise it's hard to read the values between the major ticks. So that's good for that axis. Uh, now I'm going to come over to the y-axis. I just want to plot this upside down because um, I want to um, have it going in the other direction. So I'm just going to tell it to plot the values in reverse order. And I also notice it's plotting, it's starting up here at minus 0 0.2, which is just kind of not a good place to start. So I'm going to tell it to start at 0. Uh, and there we have it. Now I have my strain versus log time of curve. Now you're going to need to clean this up and put labels on the axes and all that kind of stuff, but you should know how to do that. I'm not going to spend time with that. But that's my strain versus log time for the first step. So now I'm going to need one of these plots for every time step. And the easiest way to do that is, rather than create a new one for each time step, is actually to copy this one because it has all the formatting changes I wanted to make. So I'm going to click on this, I'm going to right click, and I'm going to copy, and I'm going to scroll down here to the next time step, click on a cell down here, again right click, and I'm going to paste this in here. So here's um, a new copy of this plot. Now if I click on the data series here, we'll see that it's actually picking up all the data from the previous plot. So we need to change this so that it's picking up the data from our current time step, which we want. So I'm just going to right click on this, I'm going to go back to select data, I'm going to again get this message about zero values, just click OK. I'm going to highlight this series that I'm working on and click edit. And now it's going to allow me to change all of the places where it pulls data from. So the first thing I'm going to do is change the series name, I'm going to click on that, I'm going to come down here and highlight step 2 and the 200 PSF, click there, then I'm going to click for the X value series and that's going to be now be the elapsed time for this sequence down here so I'm going to make sure I got all those click back there and then I'm also going to change the Y axis which is going to be the strain click there go back click OK click OK and here I have my plot uh, for step 2 now I just want to again go to the y-axis and I want to format this axis. I don't want to start at zero up here because there's a lot of space there. I don't need to know what's going on. So I'm just going to start the plot at 0.25 because that's where the data seems to start. And there I go. Now I have the plot for time step two. And you can just repeat this process to get the strain versus log time for each of your time steps. Now we're down to our fourth and final step, which is to generate our strain versus log stress plot. So let's do it. To generate our plot of strain versus log stress, I'm first going to have to create a table with the values we need in it. So I'm just going to scroll up here to the top of my screen here and find a place and I'm just going to create that table right here. So I want to have stress and that's going to be in PSF versus strain and that's going to be in percent and then I'm going to need to take the data for each of these from each of the time versus uh, log displacement curves I have and I remember that I did these at 100, 200, 400, 800, 1600, 3200, 6400, 12,800 and then my unload was at 3,200 and 400. So now I'm just going to have to get the strain values for each of the stress levels. So I'm just going to scroll down through each of these and find those values. Now you're going to need to pick these numbers off based on your, your D100 determinations, but I'm just going to pick a couple off here. So this one looks like it's at 0.16. So that's a strain of 0 0.16. Come down to step two. 
I'm going to take this one right here and that's 0 0.42. And I'm just going to repeat that process for every step. I've now entered all the data for my stress strain table here and I'm ready to generate my plot. So to start that the first thing I'm going to do is highlight the two columns of data I want to plot. I'm going to go up to the insert tab. I'm going to pull down again here on the scatter plot and again I want to plot a scatter plot that has both the tick marks and the lines. So I click that. I'm going to scroll over here a little bit and move this over here so it's a little easier to work with. And now I just need to format the axes similar to the way I did it before. I'll start with the x-axis here. I'm going to right click on that, click format axis. Again I want to plot this in a logarithmic scale and then I don't want it to start at 1 here. I'd like it to start at 100. I need to come down to the tick marks and make sure I add the minor ticks so I have those show up. So that takes care of that. I just now need to go to my y-axis, right click on that, go to format that. I want to plot that in reverse order. And there is my stress versus strain curve. Now you need to again change your title and put in your axes labels and all that good stuff, but that's how you do this plot. And there you have completed all the stuff you need to do to reduce the data for your consolidation test and have fun with this.